Good evening. Praise the Lord. We're glad to be with you again today and just celebrating God's goodness, I hope. We've been praying for different people. We've been praying that this is the Lord's day, that the Lord will bless you and guide you as you continue to serve Him. And for those who you're yet still looking for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to come and touch your life, we pray that today will be the day for you also. We're coming together now just to continue to study our word studies, the Discipleship Empowerment Word. And tonight we're going to talk about the word tell. And you can see here, we put it down here as tell me your story. I believe all of us have a story to tell. And sometimes we don't know uh, what we should say or where we should say it. But we do have a story to tell. Amen. And especially those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, I think we always have a story to tell. I don't know if you remember some of you over in the West, especially in the Canada area and around the Steinbeck area where I live, there used to be a program on uh, CHSM, which was called uh, by Paul Harvey, was the one who wrote it. It used to be known as the rest of the story. And I think sometimes we need to take time to hear the rest of the story. And, uh, but we need to take time also to tell the story that God has given to us. You know, there's two sides to every story that needs to be told. And sometimes we only hear the one side. And I've been sometimes I've been in meetings in different places or confronted by different people and they only know one side of the story. But there is more to tell. There is always more because we are reactionary people and because we react to various things. Sometimes we do things or even say things out of reaction. And that's why sometimes there needs to be something more told. So as we look at the word told or tell tonight through the scriptures, I hope that it will encourage us and strengthen us in our faith as to think about that, yes, you do have more to tell and you have more to share. And that you need to take time to tell more people about what God has done in your life. Amen. God is doing powerful things all the time, day in and day out. And we need to tell those stories. Because when we tell those stories, it builds faith in us and it also encourages other people. And if we don't tell our story, then how will people know? See, the Gospels themselves are four books of telling the story of Jesus Christ from four different angles, from four different perspectives that the story of Jesus Christ is being told so that as we hear the story that was told to us, that we can respond to it, either by rejecting it or receiving it, by having faith and trusting in that the words were spoken were the true words of God. And this is what God wanted to tell us. He wanted to tell us that he had good news for us to hear and to receive. And so as we look at this word, tell tonight, it means to declare, to proclaim. It also means to reveal or to instruct, to share with what one knows with someone else. It's like part of giving a testimony. It's something that we share, but it has to be something that is told. It has to be something that comes out of your mouth. That's why Paul tells the, the, uh, the church in Romans that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, because it comes out of your mouth, we need to confess and tell our story about Jesus Christ. And I know a lot of you who are disciples of Christ you have a marvelous story to tell. And you need to have that opportunity to tell that. Sometimes I wish in churches we had more time to tell our stories one to another because a lot of times those testimonies can really encourage the body of Jesus Christ. Things that you never thought that people were going through or struggling with, when they tell their story, it, it lifts up and it encourages others who listen. Well, tonight we're going to start off with 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 15. Samuel is going to tell us a story about something that took place with him and Saul. In 1 Samuel uh, 15, or chapter 9, verse 15, it says, Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear. The Lord told something to Samuel in his ear that day before Saul came, saying, And he told him about what was going to happen and he was telling him about Saul and that the Lord was whispering in his ears and he was telling the Lord was telling 
Samuel what he wanted Saul or what he wanted Samuel to do with Saul. And what he wanted Samuel to do with Saul was to anoint him as king. And so God was telling Samuel something that was going to be important that Samuel also tell Saul. And even Saul was struggling what was going on. He said, I'm, I'm the, from the smallest tribe. I'm from a family that nobody really pays any interest in. And, you know, I'm struggling. I don't even know where my donkeys are right now. They're, they're lost. And it was just all over the place. But God had told Samuel something special he was going to do through Saul over the next little while. And so, of course... Saul, Samuel goes on and anoints Saul as the king of Israel, the first king of Israel. And it all started by God telling Samuel something. And I want to tell you that a lot of little things get started by the Holy Spirit telling us something. But whether we will have the faith to do it, and that's the difference between us and maybe others. Samuel, when God spoke to him, Samuel had the faith to believe in what God was saying and that he would keep what he was saying and was able to do what he was saying. And it's the same thing with us. When God speaks to us, we got to have faith to believe that what he's telling us, that he wants to, us to go forward in faith in him to do it. Amen. Even though it goes against, even though we may think we're too small like Saul, we may think we come from a, a family that no one's really interested. We come from a small little city. Who's going to know? <laughs> I, I mean, I go all over the world and people ask me, where are you from? I said, I'm from Marshan. What is that? Well, Marshan is a little village. Well, where is it? Well, it's near the brokery. Well, where's near the brokery? Well, I say, well, that's near Steinbach. Well, where's Steinbach? Well, that's near Winnipeg. Now you start to get a little bit of hope. And then finally, after that, you kind of say to him, well, it's in Canada. And then some people will even say, well, where's Canada? You know what I mean? It's amazing that how people don't know anything about you until you tell them. But once you tell them and show them on a map, a lot of times I kept in my binder a map of Canada so I could tell them that Colwyn and I are from here, the middle of Canada. And then we tell them our story. We've told lots of people our story about how we met. We've told lots of people our story about how we got married. We've told lots of people our story about how we became missionaries. I mean, we've been telling and telling. Matter of fact, I even wrote a book on it telling people and so it's important and a lot of people get encouraged when they hear us tell our story and i think we need to continue to tell one to another and so and then there is times when things are not in the way they should and as we go over into psalm 48 verses 12 to 13 we can see here again where the word tell he says mark well her bulwarks consider the her palaces that you may tell it to the generations following for this is god our god forever and ever he will be our guide even till death and so the lord was speaking and he was speaking to uh to korah uh as he wrote down this song he said you know i want you to tell about zion the city of zion you know, we need to be telling about the city of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that we need to pray for the for the peace of Jerusalem. But also, that back in this time, in the Psalms, they were to tell the story about Jerusalem. That remarkable city. How God had raised up not only the city, but raised up a fortress, raised up kings, raised up a temple. I mean, on and on and on, God did marvelous things. That the people needed to tell. But how often people forget to tell what God has done. Or sometimes we even forget to tell ourselves and remember what God has done. Sometimes as we get down the road, you know, people, <laughs> I see there's someone watching tonight, right now, and, and I won't mention your name, but I can see you, and God bless you. But there's some of us that, that have gone through, you know, they say, well, here's this little miracle that took place here, or here's this little revival that took place. And they go on and on, you know, and some of us can tell you, 
we got stories that tell you where God moved powerfully in the years past. I can tell you about powerful miracles, power deliverances, powerful moves of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to continue to do that. And we need to continue to tell that. But for some reason nowadays, people don't tell much of what God's doing. I even told some people about some miracles a while back. You know what they said to me? Does God still do that? And I said, yes, my God still does your God. And I want to tell his story. He has an amazing story to be, tell, to be told. So then as we go over into Matthew chapter 8, verse 19, he says here, and this is a part of the, the ritual when it comes to uh, the cleansing of a leopard. Now, Jesus heals a leopard here, and what the, Jesus says to him after the leopard was cleansed, he says in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 4, he says, And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift of Moses commanded as a testimony to them. And so what the leopard had to do was not, he was not supposed to speak to anybody because he was still considered a leopard until the high priest or the priest at that time could give him a bill of cleansing and said, yes, I can see that you are whole. And then after that, he had to make an offering according to Moses. And so, but the first thing he needed to do was to tell the priest and then to give an offering as a testimony to what? To tell others what God had done. You know, sometimes I've received gifts and blessings from others because people wanted to use that as a blessing, as a thank you gift to tell others what God has done and is doing in their lives. You know, God is doing marvelous things. Can you say amen to that? It's just that we need to open up our eyes and see and hear. Even Jesus goes on and there is a, a, a two demon-possessed people, men, over in Matthew chapter 8, uh, verses uh, 33. He says, Then those who kept them fled and they went away into the city and told everyone including what had happened to the demon possessed men and of course then the people come out after they've been told what has pl took place and look what they do and they and behold the whole city came out to meet jesus and instead of saying man this is a marvelous story that we've told this is a marvelous miracle you know what they said to him they met jesus and when they saw him they begged him to depart from their reason the region. Here a marvelous story was being told and the people turned around and rejected Jesus and begged him to leave this, the, this, the area because their pigs were more important than Jesus Christ. Maybe that was the reason. I don't know. But those pigs all died. The demon-possessed people got set free and the people of the village didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And can you imagine those two demon-possessed men thinking after they went in the village and told this marvelous miracle, and not only was Jesus rejected, but they also probably were rejected themselves. Then we go over into Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. And he says to them, again, this is at the time of transfiguration. And at that moment, he, he says to them, to the disciples that went up the mountain with them in 17, 9, he says, now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So here Jesus said to him, You know, there's certain things that you see in the secret places. There's certain things that I speak just to you, that you don't speak to others until their proper time. And I've had that happen in my life, where I've had to testify or speak to a few chosen people and then ask them not to tell anything, so that as the time came about, they could then bear witness that, yes, Jim told us this, and he told us this would happen, and then now it has happened, and we can bear testimony. And so that's what Jesus was saying to the disciples. Don't tell everybody right now. Wait a little while until the Son of Man is glorified, and at that point, then you can go and tell this story about the transfiguration. Again, as we go over into Matthew 18, verse 15, we have the dealing of the sinning brothers. He says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell his, his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. 
So here it's talking about a, a brother, not necessarily a blood brother, but a brother in religion or a brother in in culture, whatever you way you want to call it. But he says, if you've got an ought between you and that brother, go and speak to them. Don't go and speak to everybody else, but go and speak to them. Tell them. And hopefully that as you two talk to each other, you'll get it straightened around and then you'll be able to uh, get it straightened around and then God will be glorified. In Matthew 21, 5, we have again, he says in verse 4, All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughters of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, donkey a coal, a full of a donkey. You know, a word was prophesied in the Old Testament that the king would come to Zion and that he would be on a donkey. And it was now being fulfilled. Then it goes on in Matthew 26, verses 63 to 67, where Jesus again tells them to be careful. He says in verse 63, But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under an oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Son of God. And because Jesus was put under an oath, a binding oath, now he could not refuse. He had to speak. And so what did he speak to him? Jesus said to him, It is as you said, Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And of course, at that moment, after he told and about them who he was, the high priest tore his garment and said, Now he's blaspheming. And of course, then they used that testimony against Jesus to condemn him. Then in Matthew 28, 7, we have the people going to the tomb. And it says, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So just as I have told you, go and tell the other disciples that Jesus has risen. And that's the story that we have. Go tell the people that Jesus has risen. Amen? Tell them. He didn't just die and was remained in the tomb, but he came out of the tomb. And we need to go about and tell people what God has done. Then over in Mark 5, 19, however, Jesus said, did not permit him, but said to him, go to your home, to your friends and tell them what great things that the Lord has done for you as how he has come, has uh, compassion and on you. And so again, how a demon-possessed person was healed. And now this time he goes and says to him, Go home. Tell your friends. Tell your friends what's going on. I love going home and, and getting a chance to tell the testimony in various churches. To tell what God has done. I mean, we've almost been away for a whole year now. Not planned, not scheduled, but we got lots of things to tell. You know, I wish we sometimes can have two or three hour services because I've got a lot of stories to tell. Often they won't let me do that, but that's okay. I still got stories to tell. And so a lot of times when I meet with individual people, I tell them and they're so amazed. They say, you know, you need to tell the people these stories. And I say, well, sometimes you don't have the opportunity, but God is doing wonderful things. And in Mark 16, verse 13, again, Jesus appears to two disciples and what happens is interesting here that after he appears to him, verse 13 says, And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. So the disciples, Jesus had told them, I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to come and, and, and show myself to you. And he shows himself to the two disciples. And, and the two disciples go back and tell the other disciples. And they said, you know, we don't believe that. I think you're just giving us a bunch of a story. You know, he's dead, dead. He's gone. No, he is risen. I'm trying to tell you something. He is risen. He is risen. Again, over in Luke 2.18, it's interesting. This is at the beginning of the life of Christ, where the shepherds are out in their field in Bethlehem, watching over their sheep. And of course, the angels appear to them, and a great host of angels come and appear to them and tell them that today, born in the city of Bethlehem, is a savior, a king, you know, and, and and they decide to go find this baby. And of course, they find Mary and Joseph in the manger. And they tell 
what had happened to them. And it says that Mary took these things and, and treasured them in her heart. You know, many times when we tell the story about what God does, people use it to treasure in their hearts the goodness of God. What God has done. You know, we work over here as a team of missionaries together. And I love telling our fellow supporters, and our prayer warriors, what God has done. And they love to treasure those things in their heart because they love to be connected to the story. To the story that God is telling through us as a team. Through the story of what God is doing in all our, our lives together. Nobody does anything by an island unto themselves. They do it together with other brothers and sisters. We're out here doing things and serving, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Because we're doing it together. And we've got a story to tell. An amazing story of what God has, do, has done. And even in Luke 24, 35, where Jesus says to the disciples after he has prayed for them that their disciples' eyes would be open because right at the moment they weren't seeing properly. They weren't understanding. And he says in verse 35, and, and they told about the things that they had happened on the road and now and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. See, up until that time, they didn't know, who is this guy anyway? And then when Jesus broke bread with them, they knew he was. And then after that, they went out and began to tell others about the mighty works and what God was doing. Even over in John chapter 3, when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, he was trying to tell him, you know, I'm trying to tell you something, Nicodemus. You need to be born again. You not only be born of water, but you need to be born of the Spirit. And that's why we need to go to our neighbors. We need to go to those around about us and tell them. Tell them. When you say, well, they'll reject you. Well, people will reject you. Jesus was rejected. The disciples were rejected. That's part of the plan, I guess, that we will undergo rejection. But there will be others that will receive it and will be thankful and be glad that you told them. You don't want to say to them afterwards, well, you know, I didn't tell you because I didn't think you would like it or I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to be upset with me. No, let me tell you, they're going to be more upset with you if you didn't tell them and they didn't have a chance to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus, when John or Nicodemus comes to Jesus, they're discussing this whole area. And, and in verse 12, it says, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And this is what the problem so often is. God is speaking heavenly things. You know, there is prophets out there. There is people who prophesy. There is people who have gifts of discernment. There's a lot of people who have different gifts, but they don't get used because they've been shut down so often by various believers or people. You know, because they don't want to hear what someone else may have to tell them. And I've had that in the past where I've had to go up to people. And I said, I need to tell you something and you may not really like it. But I need to tell you because this is what God is saying. I believe God is saying. And we need to listen and respond to it. Just like Nicodemus needed to respond to what Jesus was saying. Well, then we go back to the marvelous account again to the woman at the well. Where with the woman at the well, where Jesus and the woman are talking. And, and in verse 25, Jesus says to the, the woman, says to him, I know that a Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And then verse 26, <laughs> I don't know. You know, the lady, she, she, she knew, she knew enough about the Bible and knew enough about the well and knew about, about the holy mountain and everything else. And she, she was telling Jesus what she knew. And I'm thinking Jesus is sitting there smiling at her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right about the Messiah. Yes, you're right. Oh, can I tell you something now, now that you're finished? What's that? He who is standing in front of you is he. You know, sometimes we're so busy talking, we don't see what's going on in front of us. And we're so busy talking, we don't hear what God is trying to say. And he sometimes is saying, I'm standing right in front of you. I'm trying to tell you, I'm here. I'm here. Let me work in you. And of course, then she goes back and tells everyone in the village. 
She goes in verse 29 and says, Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So she's telling Jesus, then Jesus tells who him or her who he is, and then she goes back to the village and tells them. They must have think that she was out of her mind, but they knew it was in the middle of the day, and she said, you know, I've been down at the well, and there's this guy down there, and I believe he's the Messiah. And I'm telling you, he's him. He knew everything about me. I've never met him before. He knew it all. I'm trying to tell you. Come and see. And of course, then they come down and they listen and they hear what Jesus has to say. And then they say to her, well, you know, or they said to Jesus, they said at first, we believe because of what she told us. But now we believe even more because of what you've told us, Jesus. Can you stay here at least a couple more days, Jesus, and tell us more? I believe that's what Jesus wants to do to every one of us. He wants to come and spend some time with us. That's why he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the door and invite him in, he will have fellowship. Why? Because he wants to tell you things. God is a God who wants to speak to his children. He wants to tell us great and wonderful things. But we need to open our ears up and hear what the Spirit is having to say. Again, over in, in John chapter 16, verse 4, Jesus says at this time, But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I have told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So Jesus was saying as he's moving along now, he's just talked about how about heaven in chapter 14. He's now talking about being grafted in as being part of the vine. He's now going to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he's going to enter into the high priestly prayer as he prays for the disciples. But at this time he's saying to you, you know, that I'm starting to tell you things. And I didn't tell you at the beginning, but I'm telling you now so that when you see them happen, it will build faith in you because I told that to you. And it's the same thing about the last days. We are told about the last days. It says, when you see these things, look up for your redemption. Draw of night. He's trying to tell us. He's trying to speak into us and, and encourage us to listen to what the Spirit has to say. Our final verse is over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. Paul is saying to the Corinthian church about how God had given him authority. We well, said, well, how did God do that? God told him. God told him. When he knocked him off the donkey and told him, and he saw a vision of the Lord, he says, I'm going to give you power and authority. I'm going to send you out to the Gentiles to tell them about the good news. You know, if people don't go... Romans tells us, how will they know? How beautiful are the feet of them who go and do what? Tell the good news. We need to be telling the good news. We don't need to be ramming it down people's throats, but we do need to be telling them in love and telling them about what Christ is wanting to do for them, just like he's done for you. Those of you who are listening tonight, God has given you a powerful testimony to tell. So when Paul says... To the Corinthian church in 13.2, he says, I have told you before and before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and now being absent, I write to, tell, to those who you have sinned before and, tell, and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. So he's saying, I'm going to tell you right now that when I come, I'm going to speak to you about some issues. I'm going to tell you about some things that need to change. And so Paul was being used by God to not only tell the gospel of Jesus Christ, but Paul was being used by God to tell the church about some areas that needed some correcting, that needed some changing. And I think sometimes God raises up people for that, to tell them, to tell them about the things that are coming down. To give them the gifts of discernment. To give them a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. To forewarn and to tell. God is a telling person. He is telling us of his greatness and of his love. So I encourage you tonight. We have a story to tell. And we need to get out and tell others. Will you commit to that tonight? And say, yeah, Pastor Jim, 
I'm going to get out and tell others. And I will tell you, not everybody will be happy with it. But a lot of people will be thankful that you're reminding them and telling them. That's what I'm doing every night. I'm retelling them. I'm telling them of the greatness of God's word. I'm telling them about these gems and pearls that are there. And some people want to hear them and some people don't want. But these gems and pearls of God's word, they're telling us a great truth. A truth that can lift us up, build us up, encourage us, set us free, and bring peace and love into our hearts. Amen? That's what telling of God's word is all about. It's there to change our lives. So I'm telling you tonight, listen to God's word. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Do what he tells you to do. And I believe that when you fulfill what he tells you to do, you're going to have peace that passes all understanding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for speaking into our lives, for telling us your word, telling us and speaking to us by your spirit. And Lord, that we have an opportunity every night to tell people about your powerful little words that can speak to us, that can build us up, that can generate greater faith in our lives. And so, Father, I pray tonight, even as we looked at this word, tell that we will go out and tell others about the good news, that we will go out and tell others about redemption and forgiveness and mercy and grace, and that, Lord, uh, they would just believe that they too can have everlasting life. So, Lord, give us the strength and power now to be able to be tellers of your love and of your grace to others now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. It's been good to be with you. And I just encourage, just like I told you tonight, you go out and tell others now tonight. Amen. We love you. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow to tell you another discipleship empowerment tip word. Bye-bye now.